Good afternoon, students. It is so good to have you for lecture four for general chemistry one. Chemistry one, two, seven, N. It is so good to have you. So good. So I hope everyone's doing well. So let's begin with the lecture for today. For today. Um, the introduction, or the, uh, these are the main tenets or the main ideas that I want you to keep in mind as we go throughout this lecture. Let's talk about the first section. The electronic structure of an atom describes the energies. So we know that energies are quantized, and Planck's equation gives us an insight into that quantized energy. And the arrangement of the electrons, which Bohr described, Schrodinger explained, all of those things around the atom. Much of what is known about the electronic structure of atoms was obtained by observing the interaction of light with matter. We saw this with the Young split experiment and also with atomic emission spectra. Visible light and other forms of electromagnetic radiation, whether you have your gamma, your x-rays, your ultraviolet, your visible light, your micro, your infra, infrared radiation, and your radio waves, that's it from high frequency to low frequency. Electromagnetic radiation um, moves through a vacuum at the speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Electromagnetic radiation has both electric and magnetic components that vary periodically in wave-like fashion. The wave characteristics of radiant energy allow it to be described in terms of wavelength, lambda, and frequency, nu, which are interrelated. C, which is the speed of light, is equal to the lambda, times nu. So lambda times nu equals c. Okay, section two, we'll talk about, um, we'll talk section two in the book, deals with Planck's equation. I mean, no, Planck's equation is e equals h nu. And what Planck basically described, he gave us the idea that the minimum amount of radiant energy that an object can gain or lose is emitted, is related rather, to the frequency of the radiation. E equals h nu. The smallest quantity is called a quantum of energy. The constant H is called Planck's constant. And Planck's constant is equal to 6.626 times 10 raised to the minus 34 joules per sec, joules times second. So joules second. In the quantum theory, energy is quantized, meaning that it can only, it can have only certain allowed values. Einstein used the quantum theory to explain to explain the photoelectric effect. The emission of electrons from metal surfaces by light. We explained that in which you have light shining on a metal surface, that the frequency of light results, or uh, the energy associated with that electromagnetic radiation results in the excitation of the electron and it being emitted because the energy that it, it releases or the energy associated with that electromagnetic radiation overcomes the binding energy of the electron, resulting in the emission of the electron. Hence, you have the photoelectric effect. He proposed that light behaves as if it consists of quantized energy packets called photons. That's where we get the idea of photons from. Each photon carries energy E equals H nu. So Planck's equation and Einstein's idea of, photo, of the photoelectric effect coincides well. Then we have dispersion of radiation into its component wavelengths. It produces a spectrum, and we understand that a continuous spectrum is a, like a rainbow. It consists of all of the wavelengths. It's, uh, it's a continuous spectrum of light in the visible region. That's what a rainbow is. It is called a continuous spectrum. If it contains only certain specific wavelengths, the spectrum is called a line spectrum. And we see this with AES, or atomic emission spectra. The radiation emitted by excited hydrogen atoms forms a line spectrum. The frequencies observed in the spectrum follow a simple mathematical relationship that involves small integers. Bohr proposed a model of the hydrogen atom that explains its line spectrum. In this model, the energy of the electrons in the hydrogen atom depends on the value of a number n called the quantum number. The value of n must be a positive integer. 1, 2, 3, or other integers, and each value of n corresponds to a different specific energy, En. And 
we see the value or we see the notation of n in the Rydberg equation, which is one over lambda equals the Rydberg constant in brackets one over the final state or nf squared minus one over the initial state or one over ni squared in brackets. And that gives you the, that gives you the values for the uh, energy associated with transitioning from one stationary state or one quantized state to another. Bohr proposed a model of the hydrogen ion that explains its line spectrum. That's why his model was so important. In this model, the energy of the electron in the hydrogen ion depends on the value of n. And also, um, one of the things we understand from Bohr's model is that it addressed the hydrogen atom well. However, it didn't really address other atoms as well. And then it also didn't address the phenomena or the occurrence of what happens, whether or when an electron uh, was to fall into the nucleus. Didn't address that. However, in the classical paradigm, that typically does not occur. So, section 6.4, we now talk about wave particle duality with de Broglie, in which he basically said that matter has both wave like and particle like property. Hence, we have the duality of waves and particles, or wave like and particle like properties. His hypothesis of matter waves was proven experimentally by observing the diffraction of electrons. And this occurred with the Germer, Davis Germer experiment, which was the diffraction of electrons as they passed through a crystal of a metal. And it also, also we talk about Heisenberg uncertainty, in which we basically say there's an inherent limit to the accuracy in which we can know or by which we can know the position and momentum of a particle. There's an inherent limit. So either you, the more you know about, another way to put it is the more you know about the position, the less you know about the momentum in terms of a particle such as an electron. Heisenberg uncertainty, it points towards basically the idea that quantum mechanical behavior um, does not translate exactly um, into macroscopic observations. Um, what, what does all that mean? It means that because, for example, Heisenberg uncertainty is negligible for atoms or for, not for atoms, for uh, substances or for objects such as a tennis ball. There's no uncertainty in terms of its position and momentum. Um, you, can have, you can determine those things with a great degree of accuracy. Or there's less uncertainty, negligible uncertainty. That's a better way to put it. But for an electron, there is uncertainty. And hence, we have this quantum strangeness. Hence, we have this wave particle duality. It's just, there's a lot going on. And that's why we have to look at uh, Schrodinger's equation in which he explains the behavior of electrons, the behavior of atoms using wave functions. And from those wave functions, we also understand that those wave functions give us an idea. They give us an idea in terms of the probability density in which you know the specific location of an electron for a, specific, for a point in or on the atom, in the atom. And then you have the radial density in which you know the location at any point. Um, so probability density is a more specific descriptor. Radial density is more general. And then you also know n, m sub l, l, m sub s, n, the principal quantum number. And that gives you an idea of the energy associated with the orbital, how large it is. Um, and then you also have l, which is the angular quantum number, which gives you an idea of the shape. And then you also have M sub L, which gives you an idea of the orientation of that, the shape of that orbital. And then you also have M sub S, which gives you an idea of whether the electron is spin up or spin down. So all of these ideas are giving us better and better and better descriptions of the electrons in the atom. Now, different representations, whether it be the radial probability that function or the probability density function, these ideas. And then from there, we proceed on to principles, whether it be Pauli's exclusion principle, Hun's rule, or off bar principle. Pauli's exclusion principle basically states that no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. And what are those four quantum numbers? N, L, M sub L, and M sub S or the principal quantum number, the angular quantum number, the magnetic quantum number, and the spin quantum number. It cannot have the same four. Um, 
We also understand Hund's rule, in which when you are when you are filling degenerate orbitals, electrons fill them singly first with parallel spins. And then we also have Aufbau principle, which is derived from the German word to build up. And that's just display, explaining how you fill degenerate orbitals. And then we also talk about, um, so one of the things we get from the Bohr's model, um, from Bohr's model is uh, it also gives us an insight, or it coincides well with the periodic table. Um, because when you are doing uh, filling of orbitals, if you look at the periodic table, it follows this, this observation. 2, 8, 8, 18, 18, 32, and 32. And that's for electron counting. Um, but we'll get to that later. But it, go, it coincides well with some of the earlier ideas that you learn in PGTSC chemistry when writing electron configuration. Um, so that's a general overview of what we will discuss today. So let's begin. Let's begin. Okay, view. Okay, so as I said earlier, I'm a junk faculty at the University of Bahamas, and um, I want everyone to remember, you are not alone. This is an academic community. Remember to get help when needed. Reach out to university services if needed. Never give up. Keep trying. We are here to help you be ethical, intelligent, and responsible and successful scientists. However, at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, you must be responsible, ethical, and hardworking. This is just a shout out to your boy, Werner Heisenberg. He did his postdoctoral assistantship. So after his PhD, he did some training with Niels Bohr, the person who came up with the Bohr model. Isn't that something? That's very interesting. A very, a, a very good job that he got. Heisenberg formulated his famous uncertainty principle during that training period. So he was working with a great scientist and that led to him becoming an even greater or an equally as great scientist. It's interesting to note and at the age of 25, he became the chair in theoretical physics at the University of Leipzig. That's in Germany or in Eastern Europe. At 32, he was one of the youngest scientists to receive the Nobel Prize. That's very commendable. Very commendable. So, keep track of your work. Keep track of your assignments. Remember, the goal of this class is to teach the chemistry content in an engaging manner that is relevant to the Bahamian student and digestible for their understanding. The sequence is as follows. Understand the fundamental concept. Practice problems related or relevant to understanding that fundamental concept. Learn more nuanced details about the fundamental concept and practice more complex problems that integrate the details and the fundamental understanding. So a practical example of this is we look at the Bohr model. We practice problems or we do the pictures in the workbook with the Bohr model. Then we learn nuanced details in which um, Bohr model leads to an understanding or helps us understand what Schrodinger was trying to work on and how Schrodinger's equation is so significant because it not only explains the structure or the properties of the hydrogen atom, but it also explains using the computational power that we have today, it explains the behavior of many multi-electron atoms. And that is a nuanced detail. And then we practice more problems. And those problems can involve Rydberg's equation. All those problems can involve looking at quantum numbers. All of these things, they build. That's why it's important to stay on top of the things in class and understand the material and listen to the YouTube lectures on the podcast so that you can have multiple opportunities to get the content. So we are in week two. My goal, as I said earlier, is not to overwhelm anyone, but to help you understand the content well. So the Broglie's work, let's break it down. Break it down. Okay, so the Broglie's equation is stated as lambda is equal to H over MV. And this equation relates the wavelength of the radiation, the wavelength of the thing you're looking at, the wavelength of the particle to the momentum of the particle. It relates wavelength, mass, velocity, and Planck's equation. I mean Planck's, yes, Planck's equation, but Planck's constant. That's the thing that it really relates. We understand that uh, the Broglie's work is applicable to all matter. All matter of mass m with velocity v would give rise to characteristic wave-like particles, I mean, wave-like properties. 
Hence, we have wave particle duality, in which you have wave like characteristics and particle like characteristics existing at the same time for the same particle. And this was proven experimentally with the electron, particularly with the Davis Gurman experiment. Um, so I'm going to proceed, but just remember that different types of reactions. Um, it's important to know those, whether it be addition, decomposition, single displacement or double displacement. An example of addition would be the formation of an ionic compound, so a cation and an anion. An example of a decomposition reaction is the formation of electrolysis or the result of the reaction, electrolysis reaction of water into hydrogen and oxygen. An example of a single displacement reaction is an SN2 reaction in organic chemistry. And an example of a double displacement reaction is a precipitation reaction. Um, it's important to understand these ideas. I already went through an overview of the content. Um, the skills I want you to know. I want you to be able to calculate wavelength of EM radiation given its frequency or its frequency given its wavelength. I want you to understand the common kinds of radiation from gamma radiation to radio waves. I want you to understand the concept of photons. And we understand the concept of photons because Einstein described how energy and EM radiation is quantized and exists in particles or quant quantized amounts called photons. Um, I want you to understand and explain the ion spectrum. The Bohr model coincides well with that. I want you to be familiar with the wave-like properties of matter and the Broglie's ideas coincide well with that. I want you to understand uncertainty principles, the uncertainty principle and Heisenberg uncertainty, which specifically refers to the fact that the more we know about the position of an electron, the less we know about its momentum. We cannot know about those things with the same degree of accuracy in the same instance. Um, uh, I want you to understand radio probability functions. Which, you, which basically describes where the electron is at any point in space in the atom. I want you to understand energy level diagrams, Pauli's exclusion principle, in which no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers, Hund's rule, in which when you're filling the generic orbitals, you fill them singly first with electrons, and those electrons have parallel spins. You see this example of this in, when you're filling p orbitals initially for the first three electrons. I want you to be able to use a periodic table to write abbreviated electron configurations from the S block on the right, on the left, to the P block on the right, to the D block in the center, to the F block below, S, P, D, F, which are, which are descriptors or designated uh, letters that coincide well, that coincide very accurately with the angular momentum values, whether it be zero for S, L equals zero equals S, L equals one equals P, L equals two equals D, and L equals three equals F. Those are the designated things. I want you to understand those things. And F, P, D, F, they just come from the descriptions of the terms of the words sharp, principal, diffuse, and fundamental. So let's talk about the characteristics of electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves. Like, like most waves, they have wavelength, they have a frequency, they have amplitude, they have crest, they have trough, they are transverse waves, they propagate in a horizontal and also a vertical direction. Um, yes, you have your different types of radiation, you have your gamma rays, your x-rays. I hope you see, as you look at this diagram, that where the frequency is 10 to the 20, um, gamma rays, the wavelength is 10 to the minus 11. And as you increase the wavelength, the frequency decreases as you move from left to right. As you increase the wavelength, the frequency decreases. So although the wave model is a description of light, several phenomena need to be explained. The emission of light from hot objects, black body radiation, and Planck's equation does a good job with explaining that. The emission of electrons from the metal surfaces. And Einstein's ideas with the photoelectric effect do a good job of explaining that. And then the Bohr model explains tenant three, or caveat three, in which you have the emission of light from electronically excited gas atoms. And that occurs, um, or that we understand the phenomena by observing emission spectra. So key principles to know. Werner Heisenberg came up with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And that, uh, that's that was very important, very, very important. Let me show you a picture of Werner before we proceed. Werner. 
Yes, we're in the Heisenberg at the beginning of this reaction. That's the person we're talking about. Okay, there we go. Werner Heisenberg came up with Heisenberg uncertainty principle in which the more we know about the position of an electron, the less we know about its momentum. The more we know about the change in position, the less we know about the change in momentum. We cannot know them with the same degree of accuracy in the same instant um, for an electron. Um, Pauli's exclusion principle in which no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. Hans rule, in which when you're fiddling degenerate orbitals, electrons fill them singly first with parallel spins. The off bar principle, when you're building up or when you are drawing electrons in degenerate orbitals, you build it up from S to P to D to F. A wave particle duality, in which de Broglie's ideas explain that matter has both wave-like and particle-like properties, and that was observed experimentally with the electron, with the davis germer experiment. Okay. Planck's theory of matter. Planck's theory of matter basically stated. Planck's theory of matter basically stated that matter is always allowed to emit and absorb energy only in whole number multiples of h nu, such as h nu, two h nu, three h nu, and so forth. If the quantity of energy emitted by an atom is three h nu, for example, we say that three quanta of energy have been emitted. E equals h nu. So this would be a good time to practice the questions on the homework associated with Planck's equation. So for electric effect, here we see an example of radiant energy hitting the metal surface, an electron being emitted, it's picked up by a positive terminal, the voltage source transmitted, and we observe the reading on the current indicator, which is, a, it shows you that you have an electron um, passing through um, the wire. Um, so yeah, Einstein observed this phenomenon in 1905. Creating a spectrum. Key thing to keep in mind here are the components. So even for a rainbow, you have a rainbow, the sun is your source of light. The basis on which dispersion occurs is through the water droplet. And then you have your continuous spectrum when you have several of those water droplets. And as you see, the more light is dispersed and the same degree of dispersion occurs, we can have a larger and larger continuous spectrum. Hence, we have rainbows in the sky that are seen by multiple observers. But when we're doing that in the lab, we have a light source, we have our slit, we have our prism, and then we also have a black screen or some filter or something that will show us the continuous spectrum. A continuous spectrum shows you all of the wavelengths. And for a rainbow, it's all of the wavelengths in the visible region of light. Um, however, a discrete spectrum or a line spectrum uh, gives you spectrum containing radiation of only specific wavelengths. Um, a continuous spectrum, as I said earlier, consists of all wavelengths of light in a specific region of the EM radiation spectrum. Atomic emission spectra shows you an example of line spectrum um, in which you have specific wavelengths being produced as shown by the colored lines. See at the bottom there is hydrogen spectrum and Bohr's model does well to explain hydrogen spectra. Schrodinger's equation explains basically uh, all spectra well, especially with the computational power that we have today. So the Bohr model. Bohr's model was based on three postulates. Only orbits of certain radii corresponding to certain definite energies are permitted for the electron in a hydrogen atom. An electron in a permitted orbit has specific energy and is in an allowed energy state. An electron in an allowed energy state will not radiate energy and therefore will not spiral into the nucleus. These are Bohr's postulates now. Bohr's postulates. So, so you keep that, keep the context in mind. Also, energy is emitted or absorbed by an electron only as the electron changes from one allowed energy state to another. This energy is emitted or absorbed as a photon, E equals H nu. So just to drop a little uh, idea, there are allowed states and there are forbidden states. So we're going to get into that in this, in this class. You could deal with that in a quantum physics or a theoretical physics or theoretical chemistry class. Um, practice, this is a good point to practice equations, uh, practice questions rather, on Rigberg's equation. Where lambda is the wavelength, R is the Rigberg constant, and F is the final state or final uh, position of the electron, and N equals N sub I is the initial position of the electron. So Bohr's model is a good thing, the good thing to map this equation onto where 
NF could be NF could be the final uh, discrete or quantize uh, the circle, the circle. So you say you have three circles. Um, where is the first, your first energy level, or your first quantized state, and then the second and the third. So you have your three circles. For example, with the sodium bottom, if it goes from n equals two to n equals three, two would be there, three would be there. You square them, you get your value of the wavelength as associated with that electron going through that transition from one energy state to another, loud energy state to another. The ball model has limitation. It only explains the line spectrum of the hydrogen atom well. It avoids the problem of a negatively charged electron falling into the nucleus. So hence we have, or here we have, the Broglie's ideas. And the classic example of that is with a water wave. A water wave has wave-like properties and it also has particle-like properties because it's made up of units which are water molecules or particles which are water molecules. De Broglie further extended the ideas of Bohr. He postulated about matter's properties. If radiant energy could behave in a particle-like way under appropriate conditions, could the electron be thought of as having wave-like and particle-like properties? So hence we, we go, this is the first tenet, or first principle that I'm responsible to teach you for this class. So we will understand that De Broglie's work is applicable to all matter. All matter of mass m with velocity v would give rise to characteristic wave-like properties. Hence, we have wave-particle duality. De Broglie published his theory, and within a few years, the wave properties of the electron were demonstrated experimentally, experimentally not occurred with the davis kramer experiment. So, let's keep going. So, we're going to talk about, as I introduced earlier in lecture on Monday, I introduced, I introduced, let's see, I introduced, but there's associated with quantum numbers. But before we get to that, take a, we'll, I will pause the video for a bit. I would recommend you pause the video for a bit, recap, take notes, practice problems, and then jump into the section of the video. Okay, so let's continue. Big ideas. All matter is made of atoms which can be understood with their subatomic particles. Chemical reactions involved in the rearrangement of matter and the atoms that make up chemical reactions are involved with the rearrangement of matter and the atoms that make up that matter. Each chemical reaction is dependent on rate, equilibrium, atom proximity, and orientation. These are big ideas. These are the tenets, the principles, the main ideas we want to know and understand well this semester and next semester. Force is either intramolecular, so bonding, so covalent or ionic or dative or dative bonding, or intermolecular, your H bonding, your yeah, London dispersion forces, all of those things explain the properties of the substance. Um, dipole dipole interactions, intermolecular bonding, all those things. Um, van der Waals interactions. And then five, equilibrium, rate, atom proximity, and molecular orientation in a chemical reaction are mathematically related. So, the names of the scientists in science history are Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, Louis de Broglie, Max Planck, Werner Heisenberg, Paul Dirac, and Erwin Schrodinger. These scientists made tremendous contributions to physical chemistry and physics. To Einstein's theory of relativity and the study of the photoelectric effect, to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, all these ideas are useful in science today. Schrodinger's equation describes the behavior of electrons in the atoms. It gives us information to transcribe the electronic configuration of atoms with the periodic table as an aid. So the goal was to behemonize quantum chemistry. Erwin Schrodinger was a Nobel Prize winning Austrian-Irish physicist who worked on developing key ideas in quantum chemistry. His equation allows for the calculation of eigenstates of a system as well as the dynamic changes in time. Erwin Schrodinger spent most of his life as an academic winning the Nobel Prize in 1933, along with Paul Dirac. Very intelligent young, very intelligent person. 
Schrodinger's wave equation discovery occurred in 1926 and it came about from being convinced that atomic spectra should be derived from eigenvalue problems. Here we see an example of Schrodinger's equation. So, um, Let's continue. Schrodinger's equation results in many solutions, and each wave function has a corresponding orbital associated with it. The orbital and the respective electrons are specified by four quantum numbers. Hence, or listen to the operative word, specified. These are specified descriptors. So we have the principal quantum number, the angular quantum number, the magnetic quantum number, and the spin quantum number. So Schrodinger's equation is h psi equals e psi, where h is the Hamiltonian. These are just mathematical operators. Don't get lost in the details. The main idea to remember is his equation initially, or when they first, uh, when he first came about, it worked well for the hydrogen atom. But when computational power was revved up, as we have today, it basically explains all the behavior of all atoms. That's a powerful equation. Um, it gives us insight into chemical reactivity and all those things. But the four descriptors I want you to keep in mind are the principal quantum number, N, the angular quantum number, L, the magnetic quantum number, M sub L, and the spin quantum number, N sub S. The principal quantum number is an integer value that describes the overall size and energy of an orbital. The energy associated with the orbital is negative because the electron's energy is lowered via columbic interactions with the nucleus. Orbitals that have higher integer values for the principal quantum number have energies that are less negative. Moreover, as the principal quantum number increases, energy changes between the subsequent energy levels typically is less. And that, 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 that ties into ideas of penetration and shielding, but we, are not, we haven't reached there yet. Because when you, I'll just give you a quick hint into what that's referring to in terms of energy changes between the subsequent energy levels typically is less. Columbic interactions result between particles of opposite charges result in lower potential energies. So if you have lower potential energies due to penetration of those orbitals nearer to the nucleus, that's going to result in you having subsequent energy levels with changes, energy changes that are less. So let's talk about L. The angular momentum quantum number is an integer that describes the shape of the orbital um, values from 0 up to n minus 1. So L equals 0 equals s, L equals 1 equals p, is designated as p, L equals 2 is designated as d, and L equals 3 is designated as f. The magnetic quantum number, m sub l, is an integer value that provides information on the orientation of the orbital. The possible values of m sub l range from minus l to plus l. M sub s, the spin quantum number, specifies the orientation of the spin of the electron. Electron spin is a fundamental property. The spin quantum number has two possible options, spin up or spin down. The energy orbital, s, typically is shown as a spherically symmetrically, spherically symmetrical low energy orbital. The 3D image is a plot of the wave function which describes the likelihood or probability of finding a, an electron at a position in space. And it's from these wave functions that we, uh, we go to or we walk towards our radial density function, our radial, uh, radial distribution function and a probability density function. The probability density function, which describes the probability in terms of volume of finding an electron at a specific point in space, the atomic orbital can be represented with a 3D geometrical shape, and we understand that shape um, from our angular quantum number, and that shows the volume of the electron that's likely to be found most frequently. For an alternative explanation, you can use the radial distribution function, which provides information on the total probability at a radius r. So for some radius r, it gives you the idea, or it gives you insight into the position of an electron at any point in space at that radius r. The function has a value of zero at the nucleus. So theoretically, you shouldn't find any electrons at the nucleus. The positive charge is positive 
at the nucleus. So we have the right discussion, just thought experiment. The thought experiment points to the idea of strange behavior and quantum mechanics does not directly transfer macroscopically. And we can have Heisenberg uncertainty with the electron, but Heisenberg uncertainty is negligible for something like a tennis ball. Um, let's talk about Schrodinger. He was an assistant to Max Wayne in 1920, followed by other pivotal academic positions. His tenure at the University of Zurich, working along with Louis de Broglie, that's the person who came up with wave particle or gave us ideas of wave particle duality with his equation, lambda is equal to h over mv, or Planck's constant over the momentum is equal to the wavelength, and it proved valuable to his academic career. In 1927, Schrodinger left to function as an academic at the University of Berlin. It was during his time that he received the Nobel Prize along with Paul Dirac in 1933 for his work in theoretical physics. Quantum mechanical theory describes the behavior of electrons and atoms. It also aids in our understanding of an electron configuration. An electron configuration for atoms shows the particular orbitals that electrons occupy for that atom. Electrons generally occupy the lowest energy orbitals available for atoms in their ground state. The analytical complexity occurs with Schrodinger's equation for multi-electron atoms, hence uh, this is the reason why we needed more computational power to uh, solve Schrodinger's equation for multi-electron systems of multi-electron atoms. Um, when un attempting to understand concepts associated with quantum mechanics, two concepts need to be considered heavily the effects of electron spin and sublevel splitting. Electron spin is a fundamental property of all electrons that affects the number of electrons permitted in any one orbital. In terms of sublevel splitting, this describes the orbit order of orbital filling within a level. Energies of sublevels are split. In general, the lower the value of L within a principal energy level, the lower the energy E. It is as follows. The energy of orbital S typically is less, or theoretically is less than energy of orbital P, which is theoretically less than energy of orbital D, or, and uh, the, the energy of orbital D is theoretically less than energy of sublevel F. So these are sublevels that we're referring to. Um, it is important to understand Coulomb's law, shielding, penetration, effective nuclear charge, and other ideas that we will discuss later. So, um, I want you to remember that the logical consequences of Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law is a big, it's like a pillar for many of these concepts that we're discussing. Or it's like a side pillar for some of them, and it's a main pillar for many. Um, like charges repel. As the distance decreases between like charges, the potential energy increases in magnitude for those like charges. Unlike charges have more negative or less positive potential energy as the distance between those unlike charges decreases. Also, the magnitude of the potential energy interaction is proportional to the magnitudes of the charges interacting. Um, so we won't discuss shielding at this time. That's something I will discuss later. Um, as consequences, this is just a picture of Einstein's dissertation, the beginning page of his dissertation is in German. Um, he did his PhD at the University of Zurich. Um, so, it's on the new determination of molecular dimensions. Uh, we, if you have any questions, you can ask me about that in class. I'm not going to discuss the dissertation on this lecture. Um, so these are the electron configurations of the first 20 elements. Keep this in mind. I'm just exposing you to these ideas. We will discuss this in detail in class. And these are the shapes. So L gives us an idea of these shapes. Um, L equals zero refers to F, L equals one refers to P, L equals two refers to D, and L equals three refers to F. So in relation to the photoelectric effect, it was observed that metals emit electrons when light shines on them. Um, Einstein and Max Planck were some of the first scientists to suggest that energy is quantized. It was in task for you to to look into. I want you to go and research the Nobel Prize in Physics for 2018. Draw and explain the interference pattern from two splits and explain how that relates to Young's double split experiment. Those, those are assignments for you students to do. According to classic electromagnetic theory, 
The photoelectric effect occurred due to the transfer of energy from light to an electron in the metal, resulting in the dislodgement of the electron. Um, some of the key equations to know are E equals H nu, or E equals H C over lambda, where E is energy, H is Planck's constant, V is frequency, and C is the speed of light, and lambda is wavelength. So Albert Einstein's idea that light is quantized starts to provide a good framework for the photoelectric effect. The equation for the kinetic energy of the electron is Ke sub Ke of the electron. The kinetic energy of the electron is equal to H nu minus psi, or phi rather, um, and that phi is referring or is representative of the binding energy. So. I want to uh, discuss this idea. It is possible to separate light into a series of colorful lines that we call emission spectra. The spectra for a particular element is characteristic of that element. Johannes Rigberg was a Swedish mathematician who analyzed several spectra and developed an equation that predicted the wavelength of the emission spectrum for hydrogen. Let's talk about your boy, Niels Bohr. He was a Danish physicist who worked, researched, and developed ideas that led to a model aimed at explaining atomic spectra. In the Bohr model, the orbit exists only at specific fixed distances from the nucleus. The idea of stationary states in the Bohr model has origins in the wave nature of the electron. With an understanding from the Bohr model, we can describe the spectral lines as a result of when an electron falls from a stable orbit to a lower stationary state or orbit. Here we have Rigbert's equation, and this is Rigbert's constant. Um, his a constant is minus or negative 2.18 times 10 raised to the minus 18 joules. Rigberg's work on equation, which equates wavelength and orbital energy states, um, helps us understand atomic emission spectra. Bohr's model further describes that only transitions result in radiation being emitted. Um, when, as, you, as the cartoon describes, when electrons relax after being excited, is because the relaxation releases energy which corresponds to a particular frequency of light that is directly related to the color of light that is emitted. So some these are things that I didn't mention in class, but these all uh, emission spectra um, was also they were also studied. Or spectral series were also observed and studied, and equations were derived by other key players such as Lyman, Parshin, and um, Balmer, in which you have different series associated with those names. Now let's talk about your boy, Louis de Broglie. He lived from 1892 to 1987 and helped develop the root of quantum mechanical theory. So as you see, as we go along, I want you to see, yes, there are seven big names that we discussed earlier, or seven big names I mentioned earlier, Albert Einstein, Max Planck, Werner Heisenberg, Erwin Schrödinger, Paul Dirac, Max Planck, all of those things, all of those people. I just want you to keep in mind that everyone, everybody, whether it was a linear co combination of work Everyone contributed to the quantum mechanical theory that we understand today. It took many hands to make this work occur, make this work, this progress occur. Um, his theory, the Broglie's work, his dissertation, posited or discussed uh, the wave nature of electrons. So just one distinction quickly to make. Sound is not an electromagnetic wave, it's a longitudinal wave. Sound requires a medium to propagate. Light is a transverse wave and it can propagate in a vacuum. So according to the Broglie's wavelength, a single electron in motion in space has a wave nature due to its kinetic energy. The De Broglie equation, lambda equals h over mv, where h is Planck's constant, m is mass, and v is velocity. So this is the 1927 experiment I kept on referencing, Davison and Germer. Um, it basically described the observation of electrons undergoing diffraction by a metal crystal. And these ideas help to prove experimentally the ideas of the Broglie. Uh, so just keep that in mind. The wave na and particle nature of an electron is not easily understood. And this makes a path for the uncertainty principle. As alluded to in the thought experiment, the unobserved electron can occupy two states, but the act of observation forces it into one state or another. On, upon observation, we understand it to be either occurring as a particle or as a wave. A Young's double split experiment points well to this idea, and it, it is something we will discuss in class later. So, um, 
it is known that the Broglie did some work at the Ponca Institute establishing an analytical or applied science department, a center for applied mathematics. And we also, we, I, I cannot forget to mention Max Planck, the law of work on EM, um, electromagnetic uh, theory, electromagnetic radiation, his work laid the foundations for quantum theory. He won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1918. So these are your boy, Max Planck and Werner Heisenberg. Um, they also published papers with leaders in the field such as Max Born, the Born Oppenheimer approximation. You keep just think about that. And Pascal Jordan, you have with, um, if you discuss or look into the algebra, you see um, Jordan. But these are just people you want to keep in mind. Just keep them in mind. Good to know. Um, here we have an example of um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle in a mathematical uh, description, um, a mathematical format. Um, helps us understand, he also introduced the ideas of complementarity in which electrons um, is observed either as a particle or a wave, but not at once. Um, and let's rehash these things. Wolfgang Pauli came up with Pauli's exclusion principle. It states that two or more identical particles with spin can occupy the same quantum state in a quantum system at the same time. Or another way to put that is no two electrons. That's a particle we're referring to in this context. Um, no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. Um, yeah. Okay, and then you also have Hans rule. Hans rule refers to a set of rules that the German physicist Friedrich Hund in 1927 um, stated. And put simply, they put that the, the electrons fill the giant orbital singly before they pair. You can look up the technical descriptions of Hund's rules. Uh, but that's not necessary for this class. Just understand what he's saying, the general, the essence of what he's saying. Keep in mind, keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that the learning journey is, like I said, a journey. Be patient with yourself. Practice problems intentionally to improve your acumen and skill. That's where we're going to end off today. Um, hopefully you learned something, and, and if not, go back and re-listen to the video, take notes. We will discuss um, new ideas in the lecture. We will really hammer in the Pauli's exclusion principle, Hans rule, Heisenberg uncertainty, and we will tie that to the electron configuration. As we practiced last in class, we discussed uh, Bohr model, and we did Bohr models. We wrote Bohr models from Bohr, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. And I gave you the Bohr packet, uh, Bohr model packet. So just practice your problems, go through the homework, and really understand what's going on. So it's good to have you, good to see you in class, and I hope you are doing well. This is the end of the lecture. Good afternoon, students. Welcome to General Chemistry 1, Lecture 5. It is so exciting. It is so good. It's so great to have you in lecture this afternoon. Um, as I said earlier, lecture this week will take place virtually. We'll have lectures um, pre-recorded and I'll send them to you and you can engage with questions or engage using questions via email or through office hours. So as we begin, I will reflect on one of some of the great words of one of the former first ladies of the United States of America, a great orator, a great lawyer, a uh, great uh, former first lady, she has done well. And I think it's appropriate to reflect on some of her words. These are the words of, of the former first lady, Miss Michelle Obama. She said, and I quote, my parents didn't have that much money and they never went to college themselves, but they had an unwavering belief in the power of education. And they always pushed me and my brother to do whatever it took to succeed in school. She further went on to say, I knew my parents would not be able to pay for all of my tuition, so I made sure I applied for financial aid on time. And when I encountered doubters, when people told me that I wasn't going to cut it, I didn't let that stop me. So be encouraged today as we begin lecture. As I said earlier, my goal in this class is not to overwhelm you or to discourage you, but to help you become a responsible, ethical, and successful scientist. So let's begin. Um, as we begin, I want to remind everyone, you are not alone. This is an academic community. Remember to get help when needed. 
Reach out to the university services if needed. Never give up. Keep trying. We are here to help you be ethical, intelligent, and successful scientists. However, at the end of the day, you must be responsible, ethical, and hardworking. And the reason why I keep this picture of Werner Heisenberg on this slide is I am being very intentional. Werner Heisenberg, at the age of 25, became the chair in theoretical physics at the University of Leipzig. And at 32, he was one of the youngest scientists to receive the Nobel Prize. Keep this in mind. You can do anything if you put your mind to it. So keep trying, work hard, be disciplined, take notes, and study well in this class. And you will do well. So as we begin, I always like to show the structure because many of you expressed interest in healthcare careers. DNA is a very primary important uh, basis, a very important, uh, basically it provides or stores a lot of information in the cell. It is basically one of the units that is used for um, gene expression. It's very important, very, very important. And aberrations or mutations in the DNA have implications, whether downstream, whether they're downstream or immediate. Um, point mutations, whatever the case may be. However, I want you to look at this, and I want you to think about what atoms do you see, what functional groups do you see, and why do you think this uh, structure is so important? I'll give you a few minutes and I'll let you think about it. Okay, very good. Hopefully you have seen that you have oxygen, phosphorus, carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Um, don't worry about the five prime and three prime, that's for a different class. But you should see the functional groups of phosphates, amines. Um, I'm not getting into the types of heterocycles there. But phosphates, amines, hydroxyls, those are the things I want you to see and look at. Okay. So this is just showing you a more detailed description of the DNA structure. About me, remember, I'm value-driven. I want to have an impact in society using science principles. My values, my core values are respect, integrity, and excellence. So keep that in mind. The roles I've served in as I've been as an ATS Bridge Fellow, GEM Fellow, Podcaster, and the list continues. Okay, the objectives of this class. The goal of this class is to teach the chemistry content in an engaging manner that is relevant to the Bahamian student and digestible for their understanding. The sequence is as follows. Understand the fundamental concept A. Practice problems relevant to that concept. Learn more nuanced details about each concept and practice more complex problems that integrate the details and the fundamental understanding. So the practice problems, the first set of practice problems will be equivalent to the quiz I would give you. The second set would be equivalent to the homework set that I would give you. And at each stage of this class, it's a, there's a degree of, it's somewhat iterative in that I look at the feedback, I look at what you're doing, and I try to assess how can I best help you understand the fundamental concepts and best help you understand the nuanced details about those concepts. So today, we will be discussing atomic spectroscopy and chemical bonding. Of course, um, you'd explore the fact that atoms give off characteristic colors of light, um, as seen with discrete, when they give off um, light in discrete, discrete wavelengths, as which, uh, which occurs line spectra, when appropriately stimulated using uh, some type of high-frequency radiation. Um, line spectra provide clues about how electrons are arranged in atoms. Experiments show that electrons exist only at certain energy levels around the nucleus and that energy is involved in moving an electron from one level to another. The Bohr model of the atom pictures the atom as a miniature solar system with the nucleus of an atom as the sun, about which electrons like planets orbit. That's just relating it um, our analogy in a sense. Um, in terms of what we're going to discuss today, I want you to understand how line spectra of elements relate to the idea of quantized energy states of electrons and atoms. And the Bohr model gives a good description and good visualization of that. And I also want you to understand, that's the main idea for today. Um, and also how common kinds of radiation in the electromagnetic spectrum, according to their wavelengths, um, you can order them uh, according to their wavelengths or energy. So we're just going to look back, quickly look back, and then we're going to launch forward. Um, the Broglie's equation, remember we talked Heavily, we've talked about wave particle duality, and the Broglie was one of the big players in developing those ideas. 
The Rogi's work is applicable to all matter. All matter of mass m with velocity v would give rise to characteristic wave-like properties. Um, we already established, based off the particulate nature of matter, that they have particle-like properties. But we also are establishing or understanding that they have characteristic wave-like properties. Hence, we have the wave-particle duality. And those wave properties uh, were demonstrated experimentally with the classic example of the electron with the 1927 Davis-Germer experiment. Okay, you can read more into that or listen to previous lectures to him about that. Okay, so atomic spectroscopy. Using quantum theory, we can explain the atomic spectra of atoms. Each wavelength in, emission, in the emission spectra of an atom corresponds to an electron transition between quantum mechanical orbitals. If we substitute the expression for the energy um, for a specific quantized state into the expression for a change in energy, we get the following. E final minus E initial. Then you complete or you continue with the working at uh, deriving the expression, you get Rydberg's constant uh, multiplied by uh, the reciprocal of the final quantized state minus the reciprocal of the initial quantized state. And that gives you the, the, uh, that gives you the change in energy associated with the transition. And this is a, an example of the equation, um, basically mapping or including Rydberg's constant and Bohr's descriptions. So that's a quick overview of what we could we will talk about today, but let's break it down. What is a spectrum? How do you create one? A spectrum is produced when radiation from such sources is separated into its different wavelength components. Line spectra versus atomic emission spectrum. Um, or line spectra and atomic emission. A line spectrum is a spectrum containing radiation of only specific wavelengths. A continuous spectrum contains light of all wavelengths. So a line spectrum is a spectrum containing radiation of only specific wavelengths. And an example of that you see below with the line spectra from obtained from the electric discharge from sodium or hydrogen. Light of only a few specific wavelengths is produced as shown by colored lines in the spectrum. A continuous spectrum contains light of all wavelengths. So, atomic spectroscopy is kind of like an umbrella idea. But when we really delve deep into it, and when we understand how, how what is the model that I can use to really map these ideas onto? What is the fundamental concept that I can map these nuanced details or map these nuanced implications um, onto? The Bohr model is that fundamental idea that I want you to get. The Bohr model was based on three postulates. Only orbits of certain radii corresponding to certain definite energies are permitted for the electron in a hydrogen atom. So here we have, just think of the key word here, definite energies permitted for the electron in a hydrogen atom. Keep, think those, things, keep those things in mind. Only orbits of certain radii. And then we also go to proceed, and we say, he said that an electron in a permitted orbit has specific energy and is in an allowed, keep that word in mind, energy state. And an electron in an allowed energy state will not radiate energy and therefore will not spiral into the nucleus. That's kind of how he packages idea in a classical framework. Then three, energy is emitted or absorbed by the electron only as the electron changes from one allowed energy state to another. This energy is emitted or absorbed as the photo, as the photon E equals H nu. And that's Planck's equation. So the ideas of Planck and Einstein, it's almost as if we're running a relay. We're running a relay, and um, I would the uh, we're running a relay on the track. And the first runner who starts up the race is Max Planck. And Max Planck hands the baton on to Albert Einstein. And Albert Einstein takes the baton and goes on and passes it on to Niels Bohr. So just think about that in their mind in terms of how the ideas follow all good way to process the concepts. Um, and, the, and many people came after Niels Bohr. Um, we could say, you could say that Schrodinger took the baton, or you could say that Heisenberg took the baton. Um, a more direct analogy would say Heisenberg finished, uh, complemented to finishing the race, and Schrodinger also helped complement finishing the race as well. But um, these are good, this is a good point to practice questions on Rigberg's equation. 
in which we say that one over lambda is equal to the Rigby constant in brackets over one over the final quantized state minus one over the initial quantized state. And those states, those values for each state are squared. So keep this in mind. The Bohr model had limitations. It only explains the line spectrum of the hydrogen atom well, and it avoids the problem of a negatively charged electron falling into the nucleus. Now, one can ask, um, why at that time were models explaining only the hydrogen atom well? Whether it is their capacity, their computational power, you can say that may be a possibility. Because also, if you think about it, if you think back in history, Schrodinger's equation worked well or worked best at the time for describing the hydrogen atom. However, as we gain more computational power, we were able to descri describe multi-electron systems or atoms with more than one electron. Um, the thing to keep in mind here is that um, the environment, the resources, and the people who've gone before you, the ideas of the people who've gone before you, they kind of do have an effect on the work that you're able to produce. Yes, you do work independently, but in science, science scientific discovery and scientific um, advancement, whether you see it this way or not, the community does play a part. The ideas from the community do play a part. And how you uh, work with that community does play a part in how you advance. So at this point, there are so many implications we can gain from just looking at science history and also understanding the advancement that these scientists made. But let's talk about chemical bonding. Chemical bonding, what is bonding? We're going to discuss what is bonding, why is it important, what are the types, and what types and elements tend to participate in the different types of bonding. Okay, bonding is a theoretical construct that involves the attraction of the electrons of an atom to the nucleus of another atom. Now, the reason why we use the coin, we use the phrase theoretical construct, if you think about it, as we've discussed earlier with Heisenberg uncertainty, you can't really say electrons in a specific position on the entire time for the existence of an element or existence of a molecule or existence of a compound but it gives us an idea of understanding how things are attracted and how things react. So that's why we describe it as a theoretical construct. Bonding is important because it provides a foundation for chemical reactivity. Bonding occurs as a means for elements to share, attract, or distribute electrons in order to become stable. So that's why it's important. Stability, just keep that word in mind. The types of bonding we're going to discuss in this class will be covalent bonding. And covalent bonding can, well, in a way, exists on the spectrum where you have, whether you have non-polar covalent bonding or polar covalent bonding and you can look at the polling scale with the electronegativities to really tease out what type of covalent bonding you have but in this class we're just going to talk about covalent bonding strictly that's it um in terms of that category but for other types you have ionic bonding and data bonding or data bonding covalent bonding occurs when ions share electrons as a means of bonding. This typically occurs between non-metals and non-metals. Um, for example, carbon monoxide. Carbon and oxygen are non-metals. Ionic bonding. An example of this will occur with sodium chloride. Ionic bonding occurs between metals and non-metals. Sodium and chlorine, for example. This bond, this is the bonding between ions. So cations and anions. Dative or coordinate covalent bonding. This bonding that occurs as a, is as a result of one element donating. So it's almost as if you, the bonds, bonds are the attraction that occur, and they typically consist of two electrons. That's how we mark them out. That's how we describe them when we know them. So for a coordinate covalent bond, you have the entire bonding pair coming from one atom. Um, and this typically occurs between metals and ligands or elements and molecules. Um, you can think about some type of complex molecule um, some of complex crystal or something of that sort. Just keep that in mind for coordinate covalent compounds. Um, so now we're going to do a quick recap. Quick recap, we've discussed the main ideas for today, atomic structure of be and chemical bonding. Now we're going to do a quick recap. How many of you remember Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? How many of you remember Pauli's exclusion principle? Who remembers Hans rule? What about Aufbau's principle? It's come from the German word Aufbauen. What about wave particle duality? Okay, so let's quickly recap. 
Heisenberg uncertainty principle basically tells us that the more we know, the more we know about the momentum of the election, the less we know about its position. In that instant, we can't know them with the same degree of accuracy. And then Pauli's exclusion principle tells us that no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. Hans rule tells us that when you're filling degenerate orbitals, electrons fill them singly first with parallel spins. Off Bow's principle tells us you build up um, when you're filling um, orbitals. Now we have particle duality. Basically, uh, we just talk about that with the Bowles ideas that matter has wave-like and particle-like properties. The classic example of that is when we look at um, a particle or the electron. So let's go back over these things. Solutions to Schrodinger's equation. You have four different types of quantum numbers I want you to understand this semester. You have N, the principal quantum number, L, the angular quantum number, M sub L, the magnetic quantum number, and M sub S, the spin quantum number. So the principal quantum number gives you an idea of the size and energy of the orbital. Those are the big ideas. N, size and energy. The angular quantum number gives you an idea of the type of the type of orbital that gives you a 3D understanding of the distribution of the electron cloud. And the value of L, it gives you an idea of what you're referring to. So L equals zero for designated as S. L equals one, designated as P. L equals two, designated as D. L equals three, designated as F. And S, P, D, F, those, are, those letters are derived from the descriptions of sharp, principal, diffuse, and fundamental. Then you have M sub L, which gives you an idea of the orientation of that orbital. And then you have M sub S, which gives you an idea of the orientation of the electron. So it's almost as if we're coming close. We're narrowing in. We're digging, digging deeper. We're trying to better understand the electrons. We started off with the orbital. We looked at the orbitals, uh, the angular momentum of the orbital. Then we look at the orientation of the orbital. And then we look at the orientation of the electron. So instead of looking at orbits, we look at orbitals. So just, just keep that in mind. It's almost as if Niels Bohr got the baton and he passed it on to Schrodinger. But he not only passed it on to Schrodinger, he passed it on to Schrodinger and Heisenberg. So just, just keep that in mind. Just a, a, an analogy in terms of how a good way to process the ideas. From Max Planck to Albert Einstein to Niels Bohr to Heisenberg to be exact. Um, but that's a good way to put it. Um, so yes, n can have integer values, as integer values, one, two, three, four, L ranges from zero to n minus one, M sub L ranges from minus L to zero to plus L, and M sub S is plus half and minus a half. So what is it? Keep this in mind. Where have we seen this? Why should we care? And what significance does this have? So the principal quantum number n. The principal quantum number is an integer value that describes the overall size and energy of an orbital. The energy associated with the orbital is negative because the electron's energy is lowered by economic interactions with the nucleus. Orbitals that have higher energy integer values for the principal quantum number have energies that are less negative. Moreover, as the principal quantum number increases, energy changes between the subsequent energy levels typically is less. What practical significance does N have? Now I want you to think about it. What practical significance does N have in your understanding of chemical reactivity and also just orbitals in general? Okay, let's move on. Angular momentum. The angular momentum quantum number is an integer that describes the shape of the orbital. So we understand N is size and energy, L is shape, M sub L is orientation, and M sub S is spin of that electron. So it's ninja L describes the shape of the orbital values and ranges from zero up to n minus one. The angular momentum quantum number as, or as a moveful quantum number gives us an idea of the angular momentum of the electron in the orbital. So think about it. If something is spinning as a distribution, probability distribution, or whatever distribution you look at, for this time, if you look at a specific place, you look at the probability distribution, if you look at any place, if you look at the radial distribution, however, L, angular quantum number, it gives us an understanding of the shape of the orbital. So L equals zero is designated as F. L equals one is designated as P. L equals two is designated as T. L equals three is designated as F. 
The latter designation, as I said earlier, were originally abbreviations from the words sharp, principal, diffuse, and fundamental. So what practical significance does L have? Let's talk about M sub L. M sub L, the magnetic quantum number, is an integer value that provides information on the orientation of the orbital. The possible values range from M sub L, excuse me, the possible values of M sub L range from minus L to plus L. The magnetic quantum number, so for example, if L is 1, it ranges from minus 1 to positive 1. The magnetic quantum number provides an understanding of the orientation of the orbital within a sublevel. As I said earlier, it can range from minus L to plus L. So the spin quantum number. The spin quantum number describes the orientation of the spin of the electron. Electron spin is a fundamental property. The spin quantum number has two possible options, spin up or spin down. So let's go back over these things. Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You cannot know with the same degree of accuracy in the same instant the momentum and the position of the electron. You cannot know with the same degree of accuracy or the same extent the momentum or the position of the electron at the same time. Or another way to put that is the more you know about the momentum, the less you know about the position of the electron. The Pauli's exclusion principle. We just discussed those four principal quantum those four quantum numbers, N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. And Pauli's exclusion principle basically says no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers, N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. And no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. And rule, when filling, when filling degenerate orbitals, and we'll discuss this more as we delve deep into electron configuration, Electrons fill them singly first. And the classic example that's visual is if you think about the electrons when you're filling a p orbital, you know, you put them singly first, um, and you put them or you note them with parallel spins. Um, so that's a practical, uh, practical consequence of Hund's rule. And then Aufbau principle, which comes from the German Aufbau, and which gives us an idea of um, how we uh, fill, how we build up when we are dealing with um, general orbitals and when we're dealing with writing the electron configuration. Um, and then wave particle duality. Wave particle duality, as I said earlier, matter has wave-like and particle-like properties. And the classic example of that is with the electron. And you see this with, this was proved, demonstrated experimentally in 1927 with the davis Kramer experiment. So we have discussed these things and uh, in terms of wave model, you can look back at you know, look back at the previous lecture videos, and you will see how the caveats with the wave model of light not necessitated all of these ideations and all these other ideas. So once again, it's so good to have you in class today. It's, I'm so excited to have you, so excited to be your professor this semester. Um, it's a treat, it's a privilege. However, I need you to make sure that you are a responsible, ethical, and hardworking scientist this semester. You must work hard in this class. You must do your homework. You must do well in order for you to succeed in this class. Um, good to see you. Hope you're doing fine. Um, hopefully, uh, you will 